One financial misstep cost him over $4 million. But for millionaire Jamie Rogozinski, that actually wasn't his biggest regret. For the first time ever, Jamie is sharing his true story and how this experience ultimately led him to Stansbury Research's crypto expert, Eric Wade. Learn why digital cryptocurrency and blockchain technology could change the trajectory of your financial future in 2022 and beyond with Eric's free copy of his new report. In it, he shows you why Bitcoin has proven itself as an excellent store of value in the long term. You'll want to see why this is more important than ever as inflation reaches 41 year highs. Plus, the name of an important asset, not Bitcoin, that everyone should own immediately before it revolutionizes every business industry in the world. In short, today as many as 89% of Americans are getting left behind. If you don't want to be one of them, you owe it to yourself to discover the best way to begin. Simply go to betterthanbitcoin2022.com to get your free copy. Again, that's betterthanbitcoin2022.com for a free copy of this new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is May 24th, 2022. It's a beautiful Tuesday down here in South Florida. we got a big show coming up. The market continues. It's back and forth. The volatility continues. I got a great stat from one of my colleagues talking about 52-week lows, what that means. As scary, as scary as that sounds, it may not be that scary in the long term. Also, we're going to talk about retail. The retail news continues to come in just terribly, folks, and the stocks are getting crushed. Is there any opportunity out there? I'm going to look at a couple stocks. Also, take your questions live from Twitter, asking just about your specific retail stocks as well. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, welcome. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. This is Making Money. It is May 24th, 2022. It is a Tuesday morning here in South Florida. It's about 10 or 4 a.m. when we're taping this. Uh, you'll see this right after the market closes. I don't have really good news today in the market because we are down again uh, early this morning. We have the S&P 500 down about 1.7%. That was after a nice rally yesterday. So we've had this kind of back and forth going on uh, really for the last few days, but really for the last two and a half weeks where we hit a 52-week low uh, mid-May. Then we rallied. We hit another 52-week low uh, just uh, last week. And now we rallied Monday, selling back off again here today. So we're seeing uh, a lack of um, really direction in, in the short term here, uh, a, a lack of conviction from, from the bulls anytime they get back into the market. And, and I got to tell you, it, it becomes a bit... Uh, um, it causes frustration because one day you think, okay, this is looking constructive. Maybe we're, we're at or near a bottom. Then the next day, the bottom gets pulled out from underneath you. Uh, today, um, some earnings and some some guidance last night's kind of hurting the market. We had Snap, uh, SNAP, which is uh, Snapchat, the, the parent of Snapchat come out and they lowered their guidance. And I'm going to talk about this and some other consumer facing stocks a little bit later in the show. But they came out, they lowered guidance, uh, stocks down about 40% in uh, early trading, uh, is now down from a September high in the low 80s down to $13.50 a share. So, I mean, you're seeing, I mean, not just haircuts, you're seeing being heads being completely shaved. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just flat out, just taking them out to uh, the proverbial woodshed. Uh, so, so these stocks are getting crushed. But I, I want to just kind of show you the markets here for a minute. I'm going to pull up the S&P chart here and, and take a look at it for you and, and a couple other indices and, and just kind of give you an idea of what we're at in this back and forth that we're having. So here is the, the SPYs right now, SPY. As I mentioned up here, we're down about 1.7% in early trading this morning. But you can see we, we had a uh, kind of nice rally back from, from the low here on Friday, follow through on Monday. That looked pretty positive. And again, a very short term time frame. But then again, giving back basically not all the gains of yesterday, but a lot of the gains of yesterday being given back uh, today. And, and again, what has really changed between Friday, Monday, and today? In the big picture, not much. But again, it's uh, we're, we are in this kind of no man's land right now. And you kind of want to sit in your hands and wait for the next direction uh, out there before you do any aggressive buying. But as I've been saying, continue to build that watch list. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100, more tech-heavy. 
uh, getting smoked today, down 3.1% is are the Qs, the symbol QQQ. If it closes here, it's a new 52-week closing low. Uh, it's above the intraday low of Friday, but it'd be a closing low, giving back all of yesterday's gains, plus more on the downside as tech, you know, snap came out, and that's really pushing down uh, all tech-related companies uh, for the most part. And let's take a look here at ARKK. I think look at this from time to time. That's the ARK Innovation ETF. Again, this is he heavy in tech, heavy in innovation, uh, down 6.7% today. If it closes here, it's not a 52-week closing low, but it's a uh, about a one, one and a half week closing low. You can see it's very small, but it's building a bit of a base right there. Then now all of a sudden, uh, breaking below that 40 level, which was a bit of support here in ARKK. Again, being led down by Snap uh, and a couple others out there that are uh, trading related to that, whether it be Meta, which is Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, you know, Facebook Meta is down 9.4%. Uh, Twitter, symbol TWTR, down 3.3%. So you're seeing a lot of, lot of stocks out there getting hit on this news. I don't want to look at what Snap said uh, and lowering their EBITDA and lowering their guidance and saying they're only going to be hiring 500 people between now and the end of the year, not as many as they thought, as the end all be all, uh, because I, I, I view Snap as not a dying brand, but like I, I don't see it as nearly as important as a meta Facebook or as a Google uh, or as a Twitter. I just don't see it nearly in, in the same light. Uh, but again, in this type of market, folks, what you need to remember is when you have a little bit of bad news like this, it, it, it's sell first, ask questions later. And, it, and it's not just sell Snap, it's sell anything that's related to Snap, whether it be Meta. I mean, you cannot put Meta, which owns Facebook, which owns Instagram, WhatsApp, in the same category as Snap. And they're not, they're not even, I mean, it's apples to apples, but it's one really big, nice looking apple. They're one ugly, rotten apple. So it uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but again, as I've said for months now, and I've probably said for I know I've said for years, the market is extremely irrational in the short term. Long term rationality comes back, and that is a good segue into uh, this next little segment I want to talk about. And this came from uh, one of my colleagues uh, here at, at Stansberry Research, Brett Eversole, and one of the smartest young guys I know. Um, he did a little piece that he sent out this morning uh, in his uh, Daily Wealth, and he talks about the market uh, hit its first 52-week low recently, as we all know, I just talked about, since March of 2020. So, you know, a little over two years. Okay, that, that's one thing. But what I found interesting, I didn't know this, so I want to thank Brett for this, is that, you know, he, he, he says that new 52-week lows are rare and that they've actually happened less than 1% of the time since 1950. So that's 72 years, folks. In 72 years, less than 1% of the time, you have markets hitting lows. So what he gets at, basically, is saying that, that it's only happened, um, believe it or not, 23 new 52-week lows over this 72-year period. I find that number hard to believe, but I'm going to go with Brett here and, and, and say that, that it's right, because I think what happens is, and I'm, I'm just kind of zooming back out here a little bit, looking at, at the long terms of the markets, when we hit 52-week lows, I mean, not you could have a bear market, but not hit a 52-week low. When you hit 52-week lows, a lot of times it hits the low, then it bounces a little bit and goes like this, like this, like this. So it doesn't necessarily hit a low every day. But according to Brett's numbers, we've seen only 23 new 52-week lows over that 72-year period. That's that, that, that blows my mind, that number. And again, obviously, this is all backed up. But that number blows my mind. So even in 08, 09, that pullback, the 2000 pullback, we weren't hitting 52-week lows the whole time. So if I look at the chart for 2000, after we topped down 2000, to get to a 52-week low, it took at least a year or so to do that. And again, we may have hit a low, but it gone sideways, hit a low, gone sideways. So that's why you only see 23. So he looked at numbers after these extremes. And uh, if you look at any period, all periods, uh, one year since 1950, about a uh, gain about 7.9 percent after extreme 7.4. So it lagged a bit. But when you move out two years, average gain 16.4 percent of all periods after these extremes, 24 percent. And even a three-year time frame uh, after these extremes beat it. So the one thing that really stuck out to me when I when I saw this number is, you know, people like they start selling when you hit lows. 
it just shows you how rare it is we hit lows. It's about what, 0.3% or so of the time, 0.3% of the time. So you have to ask yourself, do I want to sell now when there's only been 23 of these 52 week closing lows in the last 72 years? Or is this typically a time where you probably want to at least be holding? I'm not saying you run out and, and throw all the money at the market now, at least be holding at this point. Um, but psychologically, we see 52 week lows and we get out. On the flip side, when we see 52 week highs, we tend to chase those and buy because we have what's called FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, it's a different type of fear down here. This fear is fear driven, where the fear of missing out is greed driven. Um, and, and, you know, I say this all the time, but when it comes to the stock market, uh, I have a call with my therapist, psychologist. I, I speak to her once a week on Tuesdays, 45 minutes. I think everybody should have a therapist, no matter how stable you think you are. It's great to share things, but. I talked to her this weekend and, and I said, boy, I'd like to pick her brain sometimes because the stock market, for all I can tell and all the research I've done on the history of the stock market around the world is it's driven by psychology today, the same way it was back in 1950, same way it was in the 1920s, the same way it was in, in the 1880s when we started with Wall Street, still driven by human psychology and human psychology rarely changes. Sure, we adapt to times, things are different, you know, having internet, not having internet, electricity, not having electricity, all that stuff. But psychology, we still have a lot of our caveman brain in there. So we tend to have fear and greed, and that and that drives us. Uh, so when it comes to the market, very fear and, and, and greed driven folks. Um, you know, in this type of market, I just want to talk about one more thing before we get into uh, talking about retail. I'm going to touch on Bitcoin here for a second, too. But people keep equating this to uh, 2000, uh, the tech bubble. And I don't want to say they're completely wrong, but they're, they're fairly wrong, in my opinion. Valuations were not even close to what they were with the NASDAQ in 2000. We had a P.E. ratio of about, about a triple digits near 100. Nowhere near that. We also have a situation where, yes, the only comparison I can see is there are some companies that have gone public in the last several years, tech companies that are more ideas than actual uh, business plans and, and, and business uh, models that are actually generating any type of revenue or will in the very near future. And more importantly, turn a profit in some point in the near future. There's a lot of those, you know, pets.com is always one that comes up to people's minds, but, you know, trading at ridiculous valuations with a horrible business model. There are some companies out there right now trading a market that, that fit that, that bill. However, it's not the same. Uh, we are not nearly uh, as high valuations. A lot of these companies that have gotten crushed have great business models. They have revenue growth and they're in trends that are not stopping anytime soon. Could something still happen to that company and it goes to the wayside? Sure, it could. All that being said, I, I, don't, I don't see 2000. I don't. And again, you have to remember, people say outlandish things because they want to get into headlines. Uh, why do you think social media is so successful? We like to see ourselves. We like to get likes. We like to have people talk about us. Same thing with us financial people. You know, As nerdy as most of us are, we still like to see our name in the lights. And heck, I, 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 I'm guilty of it. I was on TV for over a decade. Um, and I still do videos all the time. I'm sitting here right now. You're watching me. So... Yeah, there is an ego part of this. So for me, I've been in this a long time. I don't have to say anything outlandish. I say how I, what I feel. But a lot of people just want to say crazy things to get their face on TV. And speaking of which, I, uh, our, our head copy chief sent over this tweet she found. That I'm going to show you right now. This is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, I don't know the, the person who sent it, who tweeted this, but it says, just in time to capitalize on worries and make your weekend miserable, Journalists published over 3,700 articles about bear markets on Friday alone. And this is the uh, on, on a single day, only single day in the past decade at the S&P that there was more of this. The S&P dropped nearly 10%. So that was back in, uh, you know, March 12, 2020. Obviously, that was when uh, the height of the pandemic just starting. Uh, 
But look at this. This is going back 10 years. In the last 10 years, the only day where it was more bearish was March 12th, which we know what happened then. We were very, very close to one of the great buying opportunities of our lifetime because the market rallied 100% from that March low. So we're near that again. Again, I'm not calling a bottom, folks. But what I'm showing you here is when the media, and the, and the media you never take, you know, the, the real media people. I manage money for over 20 years. Uh, I've been in this business for over 20 years. I skin in the game. Media people who just write articles are very similar to academics who just write articles. Unless you're actually ever managed money or doing the money yourself, I, I wouldn't take advice to somebody like that. How could you? Yeah, they may be very smart people. I'm not saying that. But it's very easy to just write an article. It's very easy to uh, be an academic and say the you know, efficient market theory says this. This is what we should do. This is how you start a business. That's BS. Go try and start a business. I've started many of them. It's not easy. It's extremely difficult. And it's. I wish you could read a book. I had my MBA at University of Colorado in finance. They teach you how to be CEO of a 500, Fortune 500 company. There's only 500 of them in the world. Like that, it doesn't, or you know, it doesn't, or CFO, no, sorry, not CEO, CFO. It doesn't really prepare you for real life. I've, I learned it the hard way, making and losing money in the stock market. Starting businesses, businesses work, some don't. The hard way. But I will tell you, when you're listening, just journalists have never done this, or academics are even worse, in my opinion. They write all these books and they think they know everything, but they've never actually done anything in life outside of write books. You have to actually try it and fail and see for yourself. Boots on the ground, folks. So again, when I see journalists publishing this, it, it, this makes takes away my concern of the market being crushed today. I, I don't like the market being down, don't get me wrong. I hate the market being, again, I have money in the market as well. Uh, I, I care about my subscribers that have money in the market. I care about my family and friends that have money in the market. But I do know long term that this is part of what happens. And uh, I, again, I, as hard as it is, you don't want to be selling uh, right now. All right, so let's talk uh, about Bitcoin just for one moment. And right now uh, we have Bitcoin trading, where is it, right here? That's below 29,000 now, 28,750. It's down about 500 bucks since I woke up this morning. So it's falling with everything else. The correlation of Bitcoin to the high growth stocks is, is very, very high, to say the least. I don't like that. I'm hoping it disconnects. The, the only good thing is I feel like we're probably at or near, a, not at, near a low for the growth stocks getting crushed. And that should have Bitcoin also near a low. So, but again, we could hit 24, 25,000 on uh, Bitcoin. We could hit 3,500, 3,600 in the S&P. We're at about 3,900 right now. It, it, it's, it could happen. I just don't think we have much more upside left versus the up, uh, or downside left versus the upside uh, that we have uh, laid out in front of us. So uh, Christine Lagarde, who is uh, the head of the ECB, European Central Bank, she came out um, over the weekend, I think it was, and said that cryptos are worthless. And I wrote about this yesterday in my daily email. If you don't have the daily email, please uh, check it out. Sign up for it. It's free daily email. My team and I put together Monday through Friday. Uh, and any day the market's open, uh, we put out a free daily email. Um, cover all types of, types of topics. Um, today we're covering, uh, we're talking about uh, electric vehicles, we're talking about batteries, some of our favorite mega trends out there today. So she came out and said that, and, and I wrote about yesterday just how hypocritical she is because one of my analysts uh, alerted me yesterday to the fact that uh, the ECB, a European Central Bank, has sent members to all types of Bitcoin conferences and, and talked up crypto. Obviously, they're looking into a digital currency as well. And I, I, the reason that a lot of these powerful people, especially central bankers, don't like Bitcoin is because they lose power. These people don't do this really. They do it for the money, but they do it for power. Because as a central bank here at the Fed, the ECB in Europe, you control money. Money rules the world. I hate to say it. You control that. You can print more money whenever you want. There's only so many Bitcoin being mined. 21 million tops. We're a little over 19 million now. The next 1.95 million will be mined between now and 2140. So you have a supply that's pretty stagnant. And if demand picks up over the years, which I think it will, price goes much higher.
but it's not controlled by anybody. It's not controlled by humans. The supply is set. And that's where they, they, they don't like cryptos because they lose control. They can't be the puppet masters anymore. So completely hypocritical, uh, what she said. Now, talk about some retail. Uh, we had some earnings come out last night. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these stocks. We had Best Buy come out, symbol BBY. And believe it or not, in this down market, it's actually up. Uh, they had some decent numbers, uh, but they did uh, talk about uh, looking ahead guidance that it, it could be a little troublesome. And they think that inflation could uh, hurt sales. Uh, but Best Buy is actually up on that news, uh, which is extremely surprising. On the flip side, we had Abercrombie and Fitch, symbol ANF, down about 28.5% today. You know, I, when I think of Abercrombie and Fitch, I think back, heck, 20 years ago. I mean, I don't go to the mall ever, I don't think. I mean, maybe a couple, every couple of years or buy everything online. But look at this chart of Abercrombie. I'm going to pull out a little bit of fuller uh, here. As you can see, <clears throat> long term chart. You know, it's back to the same level that it was. If I, you know, you quickly go back to it was in 1998. You know, it had some ups and downs and ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and now downs. But it's literally, if you bought this in mid 1998, you'd be at the same level or early 98, you'd be at the same level you are today with a lot of ups and downs along the way. Don't get me wrong, there's places that make money on, on, on the upside and downside along that way. But the company's <laughs> stock price is the same damn price. It's at $19.11 right now. Uh, so, what I'm trying to get at is, to me, this has been a, a, a dead company for a while. They had a couple, obviously, retail, you can have a hot trend here, goes up a little bit, comes down. But I, I don't think Abercrombie & Fitch is a bellwether or the canary in a coal mine, as they used to say, of all of retail. Just like I don't think Snap is that for all of uh, digital marketing and digital advertising that's done through those types of platforms. I might be wrong, but I, I don't see it. Um, and then, you know, Best Buy, I still, you know, I, if I'm gonna buy a new TV, I probably still go to Best Buy or something like that because I like to see it, like to see what the picture looks like. And maybe I go buy, to, buy it on Amazon if it's cheaper than Best Buy, but probably I remember the last TV I bought, uh, I did buy it on Best Buy, or at Best Buy, along with a speaker system that, you know, surround sound. Because I want to hear it. It's one thing to read reviews, but you want to hear it. So I think Best Buy still has a bit of an edge when it comes to a lot of that stuff. But again, again, they have competition through Amazon and other online retailers. But I still think they have a little bit of an edge uh, versus an Abercrombie where if, if you're not hot anymore, which I don't think they are. I'm not up on fashion of teens and 20-year-olds, but I don't think they're up to where they used to be. Uh, so those two came out last night, very, very different numbers. Now, a couple to watch I want to bring up here. Uh, one is Revolve. I've talked about this in the past and uh, down today, nearly 10% 10, 10 with a lot of other retailers. But Revolve is about a $2 billion company. And um, they're online uh, and basically fashion forward women's clothes, uh, women in their late teens, 20s, 30s, uh, even, even 40s. Um, and as I mentioned, about a, one ounce down about $1.8 billion market cap. So I look at the financials and 2020, it had sales of 580 million. 2021, up to 891 million. Obviously, huge growth. This year, looking for 1.15 billion, decent growth. Next year, about 1.4 billion. So then you look at the valuations of that, and it trades at a forward PE ratio of about 15.1, which is nice. Uh, the peg ratio, if you take the growth into consideration, 0.63, very low. Anything below one is cheap. And then a price to sales forward ratio of 1.3. Again, very nice valuation. The, the thing is, could it get cheaper? Yes. Stock was about $90. Now it's down to 24. Zoom out a little bit and give you kind of the, the whole turnaround here. Went public in 2019, uh, didn't perform well, then started taking off as, as sales really took off in 2020s when we saw sales really take off in this company. It went from single digits up to about nine bucks. It was up about 9x. And then, you know, following where it is now. Could it pull down to 20 or 15? I don't know. It, it potentially could. But again, you're starting to see stocks come down to levels uh, that are attractive. And the, 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 the counter argument to what I'm saying here, and again, nothing here is a buyer or seller recommendation, but the counter argument is, well, maybe the consumer will stop buying because of inflation. They're not buying clothes anymore. <sighs> Boy, 
I've heard that so many times that the consumer is not going to buy clothes. They don't, you know, they don't need to go out. I, I, I don't, I don't buy it. I mean, I know a lot of people in every demographic, uh, every economic level there is. People like to look good and buy clothes. So I, I find it hard to believe. Could there be a pull down for a quarter or so? Sure. Uh, but I still find that hard to believe that you see the, the big slowdown. The next one to take a look at is uh, RH and symbols RH. It used to be Restoration Hardware. And uh, this is about a $5.8 billion company. And again, I, looking at the sales here, uh, in 2020, they had sales of $2.64 billion. Uh, 2021, $2.85 billion. The, uh, the, that was fiscal year 2021. Fiscal year 2022, which just ended recently, $3.76 billion. Nice growth. Current fiscal year, we're in $4.01 billion, and then next fiscal year, $4.31 billion are the estimates. So again, I go look at valuations where we're at. Forward P-E ratio, 8.4, folks. Forward, uh, forward price of sales, 1.3. The PEG ratio, 0.1. So low. I mean, so these are very low valuations. The company is expected this, this year, this fiscal year, to make $25.85 a share. That's where you come up with the 8.4 P-E ratio. Could people cut back on RH? Um, I had an R a restoration hardware couch once, very expensive. I got it on sale, of course. I don't like to pay full price, but that couch will last forever. I don't have it anymore. The ex has it, but uh, and I hope she's enjoying it because uh, I'd love that couch, to be honest with you. Um, I, I just, you, you get what you pay for. That couch will last forever. The people that are buying from RH, probably aren't as hurt by inflation as the people that may look to a, a cheaper alternative when it comes to furniture. So I, I, I don't see them being hit that much again in the near term, could they? Could inflation be an issue because uh, the materials that go into building that fine couch, I think it was made in Indonesia, that I had, the Italian leather that was on it, Prices go up, maybe, you know, it hurts uh, the bottom line of restoration hardware, possibly. Again, let me zoom out and give you an idea. But but again, you go back to 20, 2016, 2017, this stock's at 20 some dollars and ran up to 740. Huge gain. Pulling back now, again, could it pull to 200? I don't know. But down in this level, you start saying to yourself, unless restoration hardware is dead, unless people are done, done buying furniture, uh, I find it hard to believe that this stock won't at some point go higher. So now I'm going to take a couple, again, not buy or sell recommendations. I just want to show you two completely different stocks that valuations are coming down that I don't think the consumer is dead. Could the consumer be slowed down for a short time? Sure. Could I push a pause button for a short time? Sure. But long term, the consumer remains about two thirds of the economy. I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. So I took a couple questions I asked people on Twitter uh, for a couple of stocks. One that, that a couple of people asked me about uh, was uh, Etsy. You know, the online kind of, I always call it a craft store. It's not really a craft store. Uh, but this stock has also come down with everything else. Uh, down 7.5% today, hitting a new 52-week low. I think Etsy's fa fantastic. Uh, I've never bought anything, but the X did for the house around there. But it's about a $9 billion company. And again, let's look at these financials very quickly. $9 billion company. 2020, 1.7 billion sales. Last year, 2.3. This year, looking for 2.5. Next year, 3.05. So the growth's not as high as, as the other two I just mentioned, but still a forward PE ratio of 14.5. Forward price of sales, about 2.9. Uh, peg ratio is going to be a little over one, so not as attractive, but still not super high. Again, hitting a 52-week low. If we zoom out a little bit and, and kind of see where it's been, very similar to RH. You go back to 2016, this stock's around around six bucks. It goes to 300. So if we're to pull back to 70, if you bought six bucks and you're still owning it, you're still super happy. You're up 12x, give or take. And uh, you're obviously up much more. But but again, you we have these these pendulums, right, folks? Where was it overvalued here? Yeah. Is it undervalued down here? Yeah. Where is it fairly valued? I don't know, maybe 150, 160. So even say 140, it's a double from here. It's half, it's half of it, half of its high, and it's a double from here. But that pendulum, folks, remember when that pendulum swings, this middle right here, six o'clock, is fairly valued. We spend so little time there, if any, we go right past it. When you go to overbought, it can sit there for a while, go real high, then swings down, goes right through fair valuation. Let's just say 140 for this, right through 140, and it goes over here to 70. 
But does it go maybe to 50? Possibly. I Again, I, I don't have a crystal ball. But my point is, you have to start looking at stocks when the pendulum swings to the oversold level and swings to your favor. You just have to start looking at them. So what about Crocs? Somebody asked about Crocs. I saw a funny little picture the other day. They said, don't worry about monkey pox, worry about Crocs pox or something like that. So if you wear Crocs, you have little holes in them. So if you wear them, you get the sunburn. It looks like a little thing, kind of gross looking. Um, I've never worn Crocs. I, I would say I never will probably. It's a $3 billion company. I, I think the... Uh, I think they're just ridiculously looking personally, but they've turned around sales. They had flat sales 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, even 2020 only ticked up a little bit to 1.38 billion. 2021, uh, 2.31 billion. This year looking for 3.51. Next year looking for 4.05. So let's look at these look at these financials. Ford PE ratio 4.1. 4.1. Ford price of sales 0.7. Peg ratio 0.05. So some people may say this is a value trap, maybe. And maybe it trades at such a low valuation because it's a very trendy type of uh, uh, accessory, if you will. But again, a new 52-week low, down 9.5%. The stock was above 180, now we're down to 48. But again, what are we going to see in this long-term chart? Back in 2016, the stock was single digits, 8 bucks, ran up to 180. Back down to 48, still up about 5x, give or take from where you were in 2016. Again, the pendulum up here, so let's call fair value down here, and the pendulum down here. But on the way up, folks, we didn't know if that pendulum was going to stop at 140 or 180. We don't know down here if it stops at 48 or 38. But again, what we need to start doing is building a watch list of stocks that you want to own, whether it be Etsy, whether it be Crocs, whether it be RH, whether it be... Uh, whatever the other one is I talked about, uh, Revolve. And again, I'm not saying these are buys or sells or, or holds or anything right now. I don't cover any stocks. But what I, what I want to share with you, though, is if these are stocks you're interested in, whatever stocks on your watch list, it's what my team and I are doing right now. We're building the best watch list in the world. I can't wait. Um, I was with a friend last night for, for a nice steak dinner. We're, we're talking and he's an entrepreneur and selling a big company right now. And we're talking about cash. And I'm like, I have a ton of cash sitting there right now due to things in my personal life. And I can't wait for that moment, whether it be tomorrow or whether it be three months from now. I believe there's going to be a fantastic buying opportunity in the market. And I'm going to go all in. So I'm, I'm ready for that. If you have any cash, I think you, go, you, you get ready too. But you get your watch list built. And if you're in the market now, as I just mentioned, we've only had, what, 23, 52-week closing lows in the S&P 500 in 72 years. About 0.3% of the time. We just had one recently. You're, you're trying to say you're going to you're going to sell here and get back in. You're probably selling at or near low. Again, we can go down under ten percent. I wouldn't be surprised. But I think you're getting closer and closer to lows that you do not want to be selling here if you're still holding. In my opinion, so I hope that helped, folks. Uh, we'll give you a quick look, real quick, at the market where we stand on the S and P 500 right now. Now down two percent near the low of the session. This is around ten thirty six Eastern time. Uh, it doesn't. It, again, I, I think. I called that 34 to 3,600 level. If we get near 36, I'm going to be an aggressive buyer unless something dramatically changes, an aggressive buyer. And of course, I'll let you know uh, throughout the shows we do on Tuesday and Thursday. So thank you so much for watching. We'll be back Thursday. Don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel here. Share it with your friends, comments uh, below. We love them, good or bad. Uh, we're always trying to do better and do better for you. So have a good Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We'll see you back here uh, Thursday after the market closes. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.